Good afternoon. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure for me to be here. Uh, I like to say when, I, when they first asked me to come here, I said, oh, it's such a short time ago that I was sitting where you are. Um, then I did the math this year, and I realized it's 13 years ago. <laughs> for me, it feels like a short time. It's amazing how much shorter 13 years is when you're my age versus yours, but that's okay. Uh, and I'm especially excited to give this particular lecture uh, because I like to say I became an economist because I decided I'd rather study money than have any. Um, <laughs> My wife doesn't laugh at that joke. <laughs> it's too close to true. Uh, so before we really get into anything too substantial, we, we do need to answer a very simple question. Right? That's what is money? Right? What is this lecture even supposed to be about? Right, so I, I brought here uh, a nice visual right there. Here is it's a dollar bill. Uh, you can see it has many very important features. It's made out of some combination of paper and cloth, I believe, to give it a little bit more durability. It has this kind of greenish ink on it. Uh, naturally, there's the um, portrait here of the Mona Lisa, I mean, George Washington. Uh, I, I was looking at his face today, I thought, you know, he has the same expression, and I wonder if there was some kind of plagiarism going on. But anyway, right, so th this is money, right? But then I had a couple other things in my wallet that I was pulling things out today. I have here uh, this, it's, it's a three barber bucks uh, for my barber, Barber Phil. It says that this, this is Fabulous Phil's Barber Beauty Shop. Uh, this note is legal tender only at Fabulous Phil's, apparently. I, I didn't know you could do that. Uh, but it looks remarkably similar. Like, okay, the back is a little bit more blank, but it's definitely greener paper. I don't think there's as much cloth content. Uh, Barber Phil is certainly better looking right, than George Washington. Right? Yet somehow, right, we would say this is money, right, this is not. Right, then I found another one. Right? <laughs> you, you can tell that I'm an economist. You're, you, you, when your barber gives you, oh, this is $3 off your next haircut, you don't use it. You just say, oh, I can use this in class, this is great. Okay, all right. And then I got this right here. Right, this is apparently, it's a one dillion dillars note. Uh, I got this from the Mount Olive um, Pickle Company. It's located in, I think, North Carolina, if I recall. It's from the Delinquent Bank of Delirium, it says. Right, this certificate is a dilly, but not tender at all to lawmen, uh, issued by the state of confusion. Right? Uh, of course, many of you in the crowd may believe that a lot of the things on here should say what it says here. For example, uh, the certificate is good for nothing. It's printed at the very top. <laughs> Well, we know that isn't actually true, right? Even if right, we acknowledge that there is a certain amount of instability here, we'll get to that. Right, give me 45 minutes. We still recognize that this is money, right? And these things are not, right? So why? Right? Well, let's simply the definition of money. Right? The money is the commonly accepted medium of exchange or the general medium of exchange. So we, we recognize that this dollar, however much we, we may like it or dislike it, right, if I take it and I take it to, say, Barber Phil, right, he will, in fact, accept this as partial payment for my haircut. Now, he won't cut my entire head of hair for this dollar, <laughs> do maybe like a quarter of it. That's if he feels good about me that day. Right? But he's willing to accept this. And not only is he willing to accept this, but I can take it to the grocery store and I can buy a pack of gum or I can take it to Starbucks and get what, a fifth of a coffee or something like that. This is generally accepted by the majority of vendors that I would run across, at least here in the United States. Whereas this one, there's exactly one vendor that will accept this. Right? This one... There are exactly zero vendors that will accept this, as far as I'm aware. Right? I've not tried downstairs. Maybe they'll take it. I don't know. I suspect not. Right? Right, so it is that general acceptance right, that makes one of these things money and the others not. Okay. Now, those that are philosophically inclined should start to feel kind of nervous because you say, OK, well, medium of exchange, we'll, we'll get into exactly what that means. It's fairly precise. But generally accepted, right? generally is in itself a problematic word if you're trying to define the thing. Well, what do we mean by general? Do we need 60% acceptance? Is that generally accepted? Do we need 85%? What about 53%? Right? Well, where's the line for generally? Take a deep breath. Get over it. <laughs> this is something, there, there's going to be a certain amount of vagueness right, in this um, definition. And this is something that Mises himself, who tried to be very, very precise as much as possible, frankly admitted in human action. He says, here's the definition. Sure, it's kind of vague, but you know what, that, that doesn't matter. Because anything we say about money is going to be true, it turns out, for any medium of exchange at all, whether it is generally accepted or not. Right? We just think of money as being that one that is generally accepted. Okay, so we know, we have some sense then, vague as it may be, of what money is. Right? 
So why would we bother right, having lectures about money? Why is it socially important? Now here, I think, is really the key. If you're going to take one thing away from this lecture, this is what I want you to take away from it. And that is that I believe that money, it's not just that I believe it, you don't take that away. Take away the fact right, that money right, binds a society together right, by easing trade. Right. Dr. Herbner just gave a wonderful lecture about the importance of the division of labor in increasing the material productivity of society. In fact, it gives us a material reason to care about being around and having relationships with other people. It's not just because I happen to like hanging out with people watching TV. It's because I'm, in fact, materially better off and wealthier right, because I'm interacting with other people, even if I don't interact with them on a social level, even if I don't like them on a social level. I am better off interacting with them in the economy because we can each specialize according to the division of labor in that area in which we are most productive, making all of us better off. But right, for us to be able to do this, we need to be able to trade with each other. Right? Right, after all, I like to believe that my comparative advantage, right, that is the thing that I'm relatively least bad at, um, would be giving economics lectures. Right? It turns out that you cannot eat on the basis of giving yourself economics lectures. Right? You need to have, be able to trade this with somebody who will, in fact, provide you with food. Right? So, in order to highlight why is it that money is so important, so essential, I'm going to do kind of, I guess, the eco typical economist trick. Uh, well, think about counterfactuals. Right? So, what are the alternatives? This is kind of the obsessive question that economists ask. Right? What are the alternatives? Right? So, if we didn't have a monetary system, what could we do instead? Well, one option would be to have a system where we just don't trade at all, right? a system of autarky right? or self-sufficiency. Now, I suspect the system of autarky or self-sufficiency could follow one of two possible paths, depending upon our technological level, and I suspect that one of these paths is, in fact, impossible. But let's go with the more possible first. I suspect that a world where each of us is trying to be entirely self-sufficient would result in mass poverty and, in fact, starvation, and that billions of people would likely die. Nobody laughs at that, because <laughs> it's not a joke, right? If you think about this a little bit, you recognize this is obviously true, right? Uh, in fact, I, I know this from my own life. Right? One thing that I, do, I don't always engage in the division of labor maybe as much as I should, right? Because there are some things you just kind of enjoy doing, right? So you do kind of as hobbies, even if you're not very good at them. Um, one of those is that I have a garden, right? So those who've heard my lecture here before know that you kind of get a yearly garden update from me here. Um, so <laughs> So my garden this year, uh, we decided we're going to specialize a little bit more than we had in previous years because we found out that if you grow things that you don't eat and have no good way to distribute them to other people, it's totally pointless, right? So we decided we have one bed is strawberries. Right? Strawberries do very well. It turns out you don't have to be a great gardener where I live to grow strawberries well. They, they grow very well on their own, right? And we get enough rain that I don't even have to water them, right? They just appear, and I don't get to eat any of them because I have a four-year-old and a two-year-old boy we got in the backyard, and they eat all the strawberries. <laughs> okay, so in part I'd starve because I like my children, I'd let them eat first. Uh, but then I look at my other garden, which takes a lot more work, which I do not give to it. And even if I tried, I don't think it would do very well. So that year, that one, this year we decided to specialize in three crops. Right, one of those was peas. Right, our peas did very well. I think we got at least two side dishes out of our peas. <laughs> right. uh, we also decided, well, we, we really like cauliflower. Right, cauliflower, it's, it's a fairly healthy dish, right? So we're going to try to grow this. It's also something you can plant very early in the season, right? So you can get some idea of how it's going to go. No. <laughs> now, if, if I had to rely on my cauliflower crop, I would, in fact, have starved by now this year. It came up, and then just nothing happened. Just nothing happened at all. Right? I'm no good at growing cauliflower, it turns out. Uh, and then we also have tomatoes. We're not quite to the point where they'd be ripe, although I suspect that is another thing where I would starve them. My boys would be perfectly fine. Uh, they're very fond of picking the green tomatoes and trying to eat them. Um, and they spit them out, and we're probably not actually going to get, any, get to the point where they're red and actually able to be eaten. Right, so, now, if I extend this out, right, now, some people I have occasionally, because I make bad decisions, right? I look at the comments on YouTube for my lectures, and if a couple of years ago there's somebody, oh, right, somebody needs to like, teach this person right, how to farm, and they could be self-sufficient. You know, I just don't have any evidence of that. 
All the evidence I have suggests exactly the opposite, right? Um, and okay, may, maybe, right, maybe so, or maybe it is just a lack of knowledge or a lack of my willingness to put the time into it. But the great thing about the market system is that I don't have to have that knowledge and I don't have to devote that time to it, right? I can do things that I'm relatively better at and let someone else grow my food. And that is in fact exactly what we do, right? So I suspect, right, even if, right, let's say even if I managed to get the knowledge and managed to put forth the time, I would still consider myself to be substantially poor. Right? Because while I enjoy kind of you know, puttering around the garden, pulling weed here and there, I don't think that I would enjoy doing it 10 hours a day to make sure I had enough food to last through the year. Right? But I do enjoy giving economics lectures. Right? So even though it is something that I've managed to fool people to pay me into doing, right, I also enjoy it. Right? So it's a great thing I am in fact made wealthier, maybe not in a material sense, right, from the fact that I'm allowed, right, and able right, to make a job out of what I make a job out of, right, I am better off in terms of my own subjective well-being. And I suspect that this is true for most people, that many people, even if they could right, manage to survive, eke out right, some kind of survival on their own, they would really find that a miserable existence. Right? They would consider themselves to be very poor right, in terms of their own well-being relative to what they can do in a system where we have the division of labor, where we can specialize in those things that we are relatively better at. And so I suspect that is the most likely thing. If we devoted ourselves right, to a system of self-sufficiency, we would see mass poverty. And I don't think any of us want to go there. I know I certainly do not. Now, there is another possibility. Uh, if you've heard me speak before, I actually got some criticism of my um, lecture, I think it was last year, uh, because I didn't talk about Star Trek enough. Because so, I had in previous years, and they were very excited. All right, so it's back. Okay. So uh, the, the other possibility is maybe we have a society where we're so technologically well off that we might be considered post-scarcity. Right? That is, anything I want, I can walk up to a hole in the wall. In Star Trek, they call these things replicators. So I, I walk up to the hole in the wall, I say, tea, oh, gray, hot. Right? And right there, somehow it reformulates all the molecules there in the atmosphere into Earl Grey tea that is hot, which I personally would not drink. I don't care for tea. But I could ask it for something else that I want. Right? So at this point, I don't really have to worry about producing things. Right? It's anything I want is just freely available to me from this hole in the wall. And so that would be kind of nice. I suspect technologically we're very far from this point, and I suspect we'd also probably never reach this point. Because right? even in Star Trek, and we will get to this, actually this leads right into the next point, let's do it. Even in Star Trek there are problems with this. Uh, now I suspect the, the problem is that it turns out if you take out all conflict and all scarcity, fiction becomes exceptionally boring. Right? Right? Because uh, I'm, I'm married to a fiction writer. Um, Right, so she's written more books than I have, so look her up instead of me. Uh, she likes to write fantasy and science fiction, and I, and I share right, this type of, uh, if you can't tell, I already mentioned Star Trek, uh, I share that passion. And what this is all about, really, when you think about fiction, this is a different lecture that I need to stop going into, but here it is, right? Right. It's really about human action. Right? It's human action in kind of this speculative world. Right? So we make some assumptions about the world around us, but ultimately it's about people trying to fulfill their ends using the means available at their disposal. Right? So I, I really like to appeal to fiction because they're doing the kinds of thought experiments that we as economists also do, right? and are often adding to it you know, some elements that perhaps make them more exciting. Right? So what's another option? Right? Self-sufficiency, post-scarcity, we're at least not close to that at this point. I suspect we never will be. But even in the world of Star Trek, right, one of my favorite episodes, it's a great documentary about economics. Uh, it's from another thing. You should feel bad for my wife because she has to watch all this stuff with me. And you find out when you watch stuff with me, everything is a documentary about economics. And I just told you why, right? So, like any movie, a documentary about economics. Some are clearer than others, right? Okay. But anyway, so this one, very clear documentary about economics. It was an episode of Star Trek Deep Space Nine. Right? Generally not considered to be one of the best Star Treks out there, but, eh, but this episode was great. Because right? it turns out, even in the world of Star Trek, right, the replicator can't do everything. Right? Again, I suspect it's because actually having scarcity does, in fact, help storytelling. Right? So there was one episode where there's some kind of thing that had broken on the space station. Um, I, th I think that they had just been in a battle or something like that. I don't remember the exact context. I'm sure someone commenting on YouTube right now can provide exactly what the title of this episode is. You know the one I'm talking about. Right? Right? Okay. All right. So... So what is happening? All right, so we have this part that broke. It's like a graviton stabilizer or something like that. What the part was, it really doesn't really matter. Right? And it was something that was complicated enough where they didn't have the energy or something along those lines. We couldn't just replicate another one. Right, so 
we're going to have to get one somehow. But the problem is that we're in the middle of this war, so these things are not being readily made available. Right, so this one character, a character named Nog, who is a Ferengi. Uh, the Ferengi were originally designed to be kind of this villain designed around Yankee traders tells you kind of the view of the people who ran wrote Star Trek at the time. Uh, but they, they later became much more, I guess, sympathetic in a sense, always slightly sinister, right? But not necessarily so bad. Uh, so Nog was kind of this, um, based around this Yankee trader society. He was familiar with the idea of having to trade to get what you want rather than just talking to a hole in the wall. Right, so he said, no, you need to trust right, the great material continuum right, that guides resources right, to where they need to be used. Now, uh, there are lots of problems with this image of the market. It kind of takes humanity out of it. But I guess in this case, takes Ferengiti out of it as well. Um, right? We need to keep that in there. But his idea was fair enough, right? That what we need to do is take this, the resources that we have that we don't necessarily have any immediate use for and find right, those resources that we do have an immediate use for. We need to engage in trade, right? So he went looking for who might possibly have this part, right? And he found right, this one ship. Oh, yes, we have an extra graviton stabilizer, but we need a phase inductor or something like that, right? Some part of the weapon system that we had that broke that you also, for some reason, right, are unable to walk to the hole in the wall and ask them for. Okay, well, we don't have that. Right, so he went through a number of steps till finally he found somebody where what they wanted, they wanted a picture uh, behind right, the desk of the captain of the space station. He said, okay, I can arrange that. Right, so he packs up the captain's desk and sends it off. Right, the captain happened to be away. Right, gets the picture taken, right? Then that person gives them the part that somebody else needs, who gives them the part somebody else needs, and so on. We arrange this whole line of trades to finally end up with what we want. Another example, again, because I'm that kind of person, uh, several years ago I played this game online. You can tell I'm, I'm really good at allocating my time effectively. Right, so, yeah, so I was playing this game called RuneScape. Um, hey, there we go, all right, yeah. Um, okay, I'm gonna confess. I found out about this game here when I was a fellow at the Institute. <laughs> So I was walking through, and like one of the people who was working, they didn't have anything to do, and they were on one of the computers downstairs. We're playing, saying, like, oh, that's really interesting. What is that? I kind of look over his shoulder, and then immediately go back to my dorm room that night, and there I am playing RuneScape. Well, there's this one mission in it that is set up very much like this episode of Star Trek Deep Space Nine, where you go, okay, we need this one very specialized thing. It's only available to this other part of the map, and you end up having to walk, I think you arrange something like 12 trades over the course of this to get what you want. Now, why am I telling all of these stories? Right? Uh, I suspect because if we lived in this system of barter where we had no money but we were in fact still trading, we would end up having to do this kind of thing. Right? That is, if I decide that in fact I'm horrible at growing my own food, but I'm reasonably okay at giving economics lectures, right? I have to find a farmer that wants an economics lecture that is willing to provide me with food. I suspect such a farmer does not exist. <laughs> my father-in-law is a farmer. He has never asked me to give him an economics lecture. I assure him I will not charge him. And he, in fact, offers me free apples to not give him economics lectures. So I guess that's an alternative method that I have at my disposal. Um, right, but no, th these people don't exist, right? So instead, I have to find out what do these farmers want, right? And then trace down until I finally find somebody that wants an economics lecture that will provide me with something so I can go through these 12 trades to finally get the food that I need to survive. This is a huge pain. Right? It's a huge pain we give a very specific name. Uh, Dr. Howden mentioned this before, right? We need to have reverse preferences, that is, that you have what I want and I have what you want. Uh, or as Walter Block likes to say, if I'm a chicken having pickle wanter, I have to find a chicken having, wait, I don't know. I never get that right. Okay, if I'm a chicken having pickle wanter, I have to find a pickle having chicken wanter, I think that's right, and something like that. Right, and just to make the point, right, I need to find somebody who has what I want and wants what I have, right, so that we can then make that exchange. And in a complex society where we're producing millions and millions of different goods, the reality is we are producing millions of different goods in our economy. Right? This becomes extremely difficult. In fact, so difficult, I suggest, that a society based on barter would not be able to become as complex as what we have. I very much doubt there would be economics professors in an economy based on barter. I just don't think it would be possible. Because the market is so, so small for this thing. If we have a society that's relatively simple for the most part, I'm gonna have to do something else. I'm gonna have to try to grow broccoli, right? which is not a good thing for anybody involved. Right? Right, so. 
And so in a system based on barter, I suspect, right, we would not have this wealthy, complex economy we have. It would have to be much simpler. We would be made significantly worse off, right, precisely because of the difficulty of getting us, right, to have these reverse preferences. Another name for that, right, would be a, the problem of having a double coincidence of wants, right? That is, your want and my want, right, coincide in such a way, I want what you have, you want what I have. I feel like I've already said that, right? Okay. It's an important concept. Right. So what does money do for us then? As opposed to a system of self-sufficiency, right, money doesn't make any sense if we have a self-sufficient economy. Right? I, I don't, in fact, right, print off a bunch of Engelhardt dollars in my basement right, so I can roll around in them. It's, first, that wouldn't be money. Nobody's going to take them from me. Right? And it doesn't provide any direct pleasure in itself. Right? This, even if I were to take these and roll around in them, it wouldn't provide any direct pleasure for me. I am not Scrooge McDuck right, that likes to swim around in my... You know, piles of gold, which uh, th there are physical problems with that. If, if you become if you're wealthy enough to have that vault, don't dive in head first, please, please, <laughs> please. Okay. Uh, also, send me some. It will make it slightly safer. Um, anyway, so what was I talking about? Yes, the double coincidence of wants. So that's the problem. Right? For us to be able to arrange this trade, I have to want what you have, you have to want what I have. Right? Money comes in and solves this problem for us, not by removing it, right? We still have to have the double coincidence of wants. I have to want what you have, you have to want what I have. But in a monetary system where there is some kind of generally accepted medium of exchange, we can trust, right, that each of us has money and each of us wants money. So we no longer have to figure out, well, how am I going to pay for this, right? It's going to be in money. It's just a matter of quantity then that we have to debate, right? So. And then the question is just, how many dollars are you willing to accept? How many dollars would I be willing to accept? Is that acceptable or not? We don't have to debate about whether we should use whatever, right? Whether we should use, I don't know, loaves of bread or whether we should use shoes, right, in order to make this exchange happen, right? Money, right, allows us to achieve the double coincidence of wants much more easily precisely because everyone is willing to accept money, basically. So that is where a medium of exchange comes in and is very useful, because it increases the likelihood of for us having this double coincidence of wants, at least in terms of the qualitative features of the thing that we are trading. Okay. Quantity may be a problem. That could always be a problem. Okay. Now, let's go a little bit further. I'm looking at my notes, and I realize I'm through like four lines of my first of two pages, so I should probably move. Oh. <laughs> All right, so money then. Uh, Mises lays out in the, his Theory of Money and Credit, a great book, I would not recommend it be the first Mises you read though. Uh, but he does, he lays out, he says, money right, presupposes behind it a system of the division of labor with private property. That is, we need to have a system where we're actually going to have trade occurring, right? You need to have private property for us to have trade. Right? If, if I don't own things and you don't own things, we can't possibly trade. And a system of division of labor as well, that is where we are improving our productivity, where there's a reason right, for me to have this excess stuff right, that I want to get rid of and give to you, and vice versa. That we need to have this in the background right, for us to actually have money. Okay. So, how do, then does money arise? Now here, uh, okay, I'm gonna see, is Tom Woods in the room? I don't think so. Oh, good, okay, because I'm gonna pick on him a little bit. Okay. Right, so, so last night, I always try to avoid disagreeing right, with the people who were faculty when I was a student here. <laughs> right, so, because uh, he said, you know, money arises on its own. This is not actually true, right? right? It, we can, you can just observe, say, out in the wilderness of, I don't know, pick the middle of Nevada or something, or right? someplace that isn't a very, is very, very sparsely populated, perhaps not populated at all. We don't see right, dollar bills popping up. Right. You don't see money arising, right? Because money doesn't arise on its own, rather, money arises out of the market process, right? People interacting in the market create money. Now, I don't think that Tom Woods would disagree with me on that. He was making a different point, which was true. That is that we don't need the government to produce money. The market will produce it for us, right? So, but how, right? What is the process by which this happens, right? Do we all get together and say, you know, I think it would be kind of nice right? if we printed up these slightly green shades of paper, uh, with very elaborate right, printing on them, and then we just started trading these things back and forth. Right? We use that. Right? Right, so everybody should just be willing to accept these. It'll make life easier. I don't suspect that argument would get very far. After all, you know, doesn't taste good. It's not. It's not going to satisfy. It, surprisingly, it doesn't taste that bad. Now, when I'm. <laughs> <laughs> it's just no taste, it turns out. Uh, on the other hand, we know that money also carries lots of germs. So if, if I'm not around to give my lectures the last half of the week, you know what happened. Okay. All right. All right so 
this isn't directly useful, right? I guess I could maybe put some paste on it, put it on my wall, right? That kind of thing. But I'd rather paint my walls than wallpaper them. And it's not particularly pretty wallpaper either. Um, so it's not directly useful. So why would people accept this? And even if they did, right, why would they accept it any specific quantity, right? Why should I say that one of these, right, is worth however much versus two? These are questions we need to face, right? So how then does money actually arise? We can't leap, right, to having these bills. Well, Mises suggests, and here he's building very much on the work of Karl Menger, that the way that money arises is that when we have a system of barter, somebody realizes that it might make sense right, for them to accept something that they don't have a direct use for, but that most people do. Right? That is, it may be perfectly possible, maybe I find right, as a relatively unprimitive person that I can't eat things based on grain, right, because we have this undiagnosed celiac or something like that. Right? So, so it makes me ill, so I try to avoid eating grain if at all possible. But at the same time, I know right, that most of society does in fact right, use this grain to make bread and, and then eats it. So it might make sense right, for me to accept grain, right, not because I plan to use it, but because I know other people will take it. Right? That's the idea of a medium of exchange. It's something that I accept, right, not because I have any direct use for it, but rather it serves as a medium right, that is in between right, two things. Right? So I take it as a medium and then I give it away right, to somebody else in exchange for something I actually want. Right? So somebody has this idea that it makes sense to accept something they don't actually have any direct use for, right? and then trade that to somebody else because they know this good is very marketable. Right? That is, it is a good where there's a wide, a very broad demand for it. It's relatively easy to get rid of if I don't have any use for it. Right? So this then means that what we must have when we first start out with money, we can't start with something like this that is basically useless right, on its own. It has to be something that has right, some use that people will recognize in society. That is, it has to be what we would call a commodity money, right? where it is some commodity that does actually have some direct use that most people would recognize. Right. But added then to this use, right, people start saying, well, I I'm willing to accept it precisely because I can give it away to someone else to get what I actually want. And as this happens, right, we've now added to the direct use value this indirect use value or this monetary use value. And as that happens, what happens is we have what we call a network effect. Right? So we have this network of people right, that trade with each other. Right? Some of them are willing to accept grain because they bake bread. Some people are willing to accept grain now because they know they can give it to the people that are willing, they want to make bread. And as grain becomes more and more acceptable, it in fact becomes more and more acceptable to any individual. Right? The more people that want grain, now I can sell not, now I can give my grain not just right, to those people that want to bake bread directly, but to those people that want to give the grain to somebody else. Right? Now it becomes all the more desirable for me to accept grain, again, even if I'm not going to use it. Right? Like many things, these network effects are not limited to money. They're all over the place. Right? It's anything that is more useful the more people there are that use it. Right, telephones are this way. Right, the first telephone, if you only produce one, it's not very useful. Right? That's why you produce it in a pair the first time. Right? And as we have more and more telephones, they become exponentially more and more useful. Even some things we may not expect right, to, be, uh, to have these network effects seem to. Right? Uh, I think of Pokemon Go, for example making confessions we may as well. My plan was, to, okay, you know, I, I'm so bad with my time. I really am. I'm going to stay away from this one. But it turns out my wife is not as, even as good with her time as I am. So she decided to go, go for it. This looks like fun to her. And then my boys decided it also looks like fun. They're four and two, right? And they're, oh yeah, let's play Pokemon together. And it turns out that when my wife takes her phone and hands it to my four-year-old, the two-year-old gets very upset or that he doesn't have to have a phone to play Pokemon Go on. This is a network effect at work. So install Pokemon Go, and now, now I'm out there walking around Auburn in 90-degree weather trying to find Pokestops right, so I can get enough um, Pokeballs to catch whatever happens to be near here. Okay. That's a network effect. Right. And we know that we, have, we see this network effect at work, not just because, and now we're finding out we can possibly trade Pokemon. Oh, big announcement. If you haven't heard that yet, it's coming. Um, <laughs> right. Network effects. Right. But we already see this just from the social aspect. Right? My wife and I went to um, one of the neighborhood parks because, again, this is the kind of thing we are doing now. It was packed. It was packed with people. We had gone here before because there's a playground my kids like to play on. 
and it was normally fairly empty. We had to drive around the parking lot a couple times looking for a space, right? Because it was just packed with people, right? There's this social element, right? Social elements tend to bring with them network effects, right? If it's something you like to do together, network effects tend to be very big. Language is, is another one, right? So I've been spending some time trying to learn Esperanto because I don't actually understand network effects. If you've never heard of Esperanto, there's a reason, it turns out. I think there are at least 2,000 of us that have tried to learn some Esperanto at some point in our lives. Not a useful language compared to English or Spanish or take any other language you've actually heard of. But there's network effects there too, and network effects with money. The more people there are that accept dollar bills or that accept grain or that accept gold coins, the more acceptable these things become, and they tend to spread, therefore, throughout society. And so this is how money would tend to arise. Now, at this point, Mises would point out, then, we really understand that the function of money, the primary function, is to facilitate right, the business of the market by acting as this common medium of exchange right, that everybody accepts. That's the primary function. But we add to this, and it does adopt other functions as well. Uh, here I'm borrowing words that I first learned from um, Dr. Howden, actually, a couple years ago. Uh, media, let's see, what is it? Money is a matter of functions for right, a medium, a measure, a standard, a store. I like rhyming, so. so there we go. I'm going to do those, but not in that order. All right, so the medium of exchange, we've already talked about. Helping to ease these transactions by making the double coincidence of wants more likely. Uh, secondly, a standard of deferred payment. That'd be the standard in that list. Now here, Mises makes a very important point, and the standard of deferred payment is really just a way of saying that money is the medium of exchange for credit transactions. That is where we buy now, pay later, that type of thing. You'll learn certainly more about that later on in the week. Uh, money is also a store of value. That is, it transmits value through time and space, which makes me think about Doctor Who, and I'm going to have to fight that urge because time. Okay, so transmits value through time and space. That is, I can hold on to this dollar bill. It will be the same physical dollar bill next year. It may not buy quite as much, right? But it will transmit some of that value that it has today right into the next year in a way that is very different from many other goods that are not quite so durable. I would suggest that, say, uh, this dollar bill is a substantially better store of value than, say, if I took, I don't know, a little baggie of milk and stuck it in my pocket for the next year. Not the same milk. Right? It fundamentally changes over the course of that year in a way that this does not. Okay. All right, so it's a store of value. Not the only one, right, but it, it is a store of value. Now, one point that I would make here right, is that the storability of a good tends to make it more marketable. Right? After all, then I, then I know that I don't have to get rid of the thing right away. I can hold on to it for a while. Right? So one of the reasons I've mentioned grain is that it's something that appears in fairly primitive economies that stores fairly well. And right? as long as you keep it fairly dry, it can last a very long time. Right? Right? So it ends up grain was one of the fairly early forms that money took. Right? So storability tends to make these goods more marketable. And therefore, it shouldn't be a surprise that it's these storable goods that tend to arise early on as money. Okay. Uh, money also serves right, this measure. Um, I prefer the term unit of account. Okay. Or that is that we express the objective exchange value of goods, that is the price of goods, in money. Right. That, is, it's, that makes it useful then for economic calculation, which you've heard hinted at a couple times already, I know. I will hint at it another time and let Dr. Salerno talk about it, I believe, tomorrow morning. Right. Economic calculation, very, very important if we want to have a complex economy. That's really what I'm basing my argument when I say I don't think we'd have as complex an economy without money. It's because without money, we can't do economic calculation. We need economic calculation if we're going to have this complex capital structure, which Dr. Garrison's going to talk about at 3 o'clock, I believe. Right. And if we're going to have this complex economy, we're all trading in these really weird, very specific things. Right? You think about something like uh, very specific chips that have very specific functions inside of a smartphone, that kind of thing. I can't imagine a primitive economy based on barter coming up with this. Right? You need to have this complex structure of production for that to occur. Right, so we need a unit of account in order right, for us to be able to do economic calculation to decide right, which lines we should go down, which lines we should not. Okay. Right, so money has these other secondary functions which are still very important. We can then also think about what are the traits that would make a money a good money, uh, that would make a say, commodity serve as a good money. Now based on everything we've done so far, thinking about these various uses, we should be able to conclude that first money needs to be portable. That is, it should be easily transported from one place to another. After all, if I can't take my money to market with me, it's not going to be very useful. 
Money should also be divisible. I suggest its divisibility, but when we look at some of the research, it suggests that cattle was a very early form of money. Uh, we switched fairly quickly to grain because two halves of a cow are fundamentally different from a whole cow. It's not the same thing, right? On the other hand, you can take, say, a cup of grain, something like that, divide it into two half cups of grain, put them back together, it makes no difference, right? right? You can divide and you also can recombine in a way that you cannot with, say, animals. It needs to be fungible. Fungible just meaning that one unit is basically the same as any other unit of the good, right? This is generally true with most grain, it turns out, right? As long as you have a particular quality and type of grain, it doesn't matter which particular grain you have. Uh, another needs to be relatively scarce, that it is something that would therefore have some economic value, it would be an economic good, right? So air makes a terrible money, right? Despite the fact there's a broad-based demand for it being the last thing we need. So we need something broad-based demand, relatively scarce, so it will actually have some value, right? Fungible, various units can be interchanged without a problem, divisibility, and also portability. All of these will help aid the function of money as a medium of exchange. Now, as we've watched over time in the market, we can see this transition right? as we move from, say, cattle, which aren't a reasonable okay, reasonably okay money. It's fairly mobile, it turns out. Not necessarily easy to direct, but it's fairly mobile. It'll walk there itself. Right? Just have to get it to go the right place. We've moved from there to something like grain, move from there toward precious metals, things like gold and silver, which one seems to depend on geography. Right, so why would we make these transitions? Well, as with anything else in the market, when a better good comes along and we find out it fulfills a function, right, we start switching over to the better good that fulfills that function. Right? Right, so grain, it turns out, for very good reason, right, is better than cattle to, to serve as a form of money. Right? It turns out gold and silver are even better. Right? After all, grain, it will eventually rot. Right? You do also have the possibility that it's gonna get wet, which makes the rot happen faster. The same is not true, however, for gold and silver. Right? Gold and silver, you can take it, you can throw it into the ocean for hundreds of years, pull it back up, it's exactly the same gold. It makes no difference. It's very, very durable, it stays the same. Not only that, but gold and silver are remarkably divisible. In fact, we have, um, the Spanish system was built around this idea of pieces of eight, which was literally taking gold coins, cutting them up into eighths, right? which then if you wanted to, you could melt down, put back together, no problem. Right? Easily divisible, easily recombinable, without any kind of problem at all. Again, controlling for quality, certainly fungible, very scarce. Right? Gold and silver, precious metals, they're called precious for a reason, that is, there isn't a whole lot of them around. Okay. All right, so very, very good monies, gold and silver, appear to arise on the market. Alongside what we call money substitutes. Right? That is, that people did not always carry around with them gold coins or silver coins, but we had perhaps things that looked suspiciously similar to this, or right, that served as a claim on that coin. It turns out that if you're carrying a lot of gold and silver coins around in your pockets, it makes a lot of noise. And it turns out that at least good thieves can hear. Right? You can carry a lot of these around in your pocket. It makes very little noise. Right? So there's a security advantage to this. Right? Not to mention, this is in fact lighter right, than a coin. Now, I guess that's not true for a dollar's worth of gold. You can barely see a dollar's worth of gold nowadays. Um, right? But it could potentially be lighter, depending on how many zeros we add to this thing. Talk about zeros in a second. Okay. All right. So, right, point being, having these money substitutes was something that was useful, and they tended to circulate alongside of monies. But this ended up creating a problem. Now, Dr. Herbner is going to go into more detail on this when he talks about fractional reserve banking. But we start to see right, these paper certificates take on a life of their own. Right? And through various interventions that I will let um, Dr. Herbner talk about, we end up transitioning away from a gold and silver based money to a paper based money. Now, the way this happened, it was in no way natural. It was not a, a part of the market process. That we moved away from having these gold and silver coins to exclusively right, using this paper money that I cannot, in fact, go to, say, a warehouse and say, I'd like to exchange this for the gold that backs it. I can't do that at this point. In fact, it was the force of government that led to that transition. First, in the 1930s, right, FDR said, no more, monetary use of, no more monetary gold is allowed to be held within the United States. If you have actual physical gold that has some kind of monetary form to it, bars, coins, et cetera, turn them in, we will hand you this paper stuff in exchange. Right? If you have a wedding ring, that's fine, you can keep that, but not much more. Okay. Then we have, uh, in the 1970s, right, uh, President Nixon right, making that final break from right, these dollars, which were still a claim to gold, 
officially, though only foreigners could actually make good on that because Americans weren't allowed to hold the gold, right? Well, we were too nervous. There were lots of these paper bills floating around outside of our borders. We didn't actually have enough gold in our vaults to back them all. And it wasn't just making us nervous in the States, it was making people nervous abroad as well. Uh, France in particular was very, very nervous about the dollars they were holding and kind of wanted the gold back. So President Nixon said, oh, by the way, these actually aren't good as gold anymore. Right? They, they have a life of their own and they continue on down to this day. Right? So the way that this paper money acquired its value and its use as a common medium of exchange was because it was tied right, originally right, to the gold that backed it. And we can actually see this kind of thing happen when we have designs for new currency arise, when we look at, say, the history of the euro and the way that it was introduced. It was really introduced on the basis of previously existing fiat currencies in Europe. For us to have some sense of what it was worth, we needed to tie it to something that already had a value in the minds of people. Which then brings up the question of the specific value of money. So we know that this is a dollar, we have some rough idea of what it's worth. Now, we've talked about the social value of money, that this makes us more productive by using trade, but why is a dollar worth a dollar in exchange? Now here, to understand the value of money, we first need to kind of think about how we talk about that. Right, the value of a t-shirt is something like $10, say. Right? The value of a dollar is a dollar, is not nearly as useful. Right? So we should think of the value of money in terms of the purchasing power. That is, what can this dollar get you in exchange? I think I gave a few examples, right? A part of a haircut, right? A part of a coffee, right? Maybe even a whole candy bar some places, right? That kind of thing. The various things the money could buy. Now, once we make that leap, I don't actually have to do anything to say what determines the value of money. Right? Supply and demand. There we go. Right? Like with any, any economic good, right? the greater the supply, right, the lower the value of the good is going to go. That is, our money is going to buy less the greater the supply of money there is. Right? We would often call this price inflation. Right? Generally, prices are going to go up. Right? As prices go up, my money can't buy quite so much. And also the demand for money would have an impact as well. If people decide that they don't want to hold on to money anymore, or at least hold on to money in this form, right, it's going to lose value. Right? Exactly as if the demand for horse-drawn carriages falls. Right? Horse-drawn carriages are going to lose value. Right? Right? So it is exactly the same um, supply and demand that determine the value of money as anything else. Now, there, there is an issue here, though, that Mises deals with. That is, when we think about money's demand, it is slightly different. Right, but meaningfully different right, from the demand for other goods. Because for most goods, right, the way that it, things work is that we know that this good is useful for fulfilling some sort of need. Right? So right now, my mouth is feeling pretty dry. Okay. There's an objective use value in this water. It can satiate my thirst, or at least help a little bit. Ah. Because of that objective use value, I then subjectively recognize this value and decide that having a bottle of water is in fact something that I'm willing to do. I'd in fact be willing to give money right, to get bottles of water. This then leads to right, the supply of and demand for bottles of water, leading then to the objective exchange value or the price. Now money is a little bit different because we started by saying that money as money, right, this dollar bill, right, does not have an objective use value. It is not directly useful at this point. Yet, we do know that it does have value in exchange. I can use it to buy other stuff. So how does this work? Right. Well, now here's the problem. Right. Right. The reason I want this right, is that it has value in exchange. Right. So it has this objective exchange value. I can use this to buy other things objectively. Right. Therefore, I decide that I want money. That's the subjective value that I attach to it. And because of that subjective value, I, we can therefore derive demand and supply. Right. And that leads to an objective exchange value. This feels like circular reasoning because it is, or appears to be. Right? Right, so that was the problem right, that Mises faced, was how do we, right, how do we make this work right, without getting into this circular reasoning, which basically boils down to saying that money has value because money has value. Right? That doesn't tell us anything. Right? We're supposed to explain value as economists. And so he gives us what is famously called the regression theorem. Now, I'm not going to go into great detail on this, except to say we've actually already uncovered the regression theorem to some degree. Right? Because here's why. Right? After all, right, the reason that I am willing to accept this dollar right now is that I have in the past observed right, that it had value in exchange. Right? Oh, add the time element, right? and now we've broken the circle. Right? So 
So I, had this, so I saw this dollar had value yesterday. That makes me value it today. I'm willing to accept it as a means of payment or as a medium of exchange. And my value that I attach to it today, subjectively, then helps to determine what is its value in exchange today. Right? So across time, right, the objective exchange value today is based on my subjective value today, which was based on the objective value yesterday, right? okay. what I previously observed. Of course, then we just have to go back a step, right? I can't, I can't go back the step because microphone. Um, so objective exchange value yesterday was determined then by the subjective value yesterday, which was determined by the objective value the day before yesterday. I don't feel like we've improved things, right? We're just kind of going to go back and forth, back down, turtles all the way down. Don't we have a problem there? Right? Well, no, we don't. And that is what the origin of money tells us. When we understand the origin of money, we don't trace this all the way back, turtles all the way down to infinity. We trace it back to the time when we were actually using a commodity that did actually have direct use value, where people wanted the thing because it was directly useful. So there was a true beginning at the end. I'll keep that. There's a true beginning at the end of this line of reasoning. There was a true beginning in time that then led to the value that money has today. So I'm going to talk a little bit in the time remaining, which is very, very short, I think 30 seconds, about changes in the money supply. Right? Now, one of the big points that I'm going to emphasize here is that Austrians take a slightly different view of this than you see in the mainstream. Right? In the mainstream, we will often see um, touted, right, something like the Angel Gabriel or helicopter model, right, something along the lines of saying, well, we increase the money supply, say we double it just to make the math easy. Well, all that really does is double prices and wages, right? So not really a big problem, right? Okay, numbers all look bigger, but so what? This doesn't make any difference. But as an Austrian, we understand when we move away from this aggregate level down to the individual level, money does not, in fact, drop out of a helicopter evenly across the entire economy. It enters at specific points. Right? Now, people that really take this Angel Gabriel um, helicopter kind of view that money just kind of drops evenly across the economy have no way of understanding why counterfeiting would be attractive. Right? Why would you counterfeit if that's all that's happening? You print out a bunch of money, then prices all rise in proportion. You're not, in fact, any better off. Except you are better off because your amount of money has increased faster than prices have. Right? Right. So that is, in fact, that's going to have consequences. You are made better off as a counterfeiter because you are printing money at such a rate and it is acquiring to you, right, so that you can actually get more stuff. As a whole, we don't have more stuff. We're not more wealthy as a society, but you individually are more wealthy. Now, if we start understanding this way, things this way, we can understand the argument that increases in the money supply in our system lead to greater inequality, right, which certain people are concerned about. Right? Right, so let's trace out right, how does money work and get into our economy. Now, in our economy, a fiat-based system, right, Money first comes in at the point of the Federal Reserve, right, who's in charge of effectively printing it. Okay, physically, they don't print it, whatever. Right, they create the money, they get it first. Who do they hand it to? Right, well, they hand it to banks. There's good research showing that if you want to look at inequality specifically between CEO pay and kind of the average worker pay, do you know where the gap is largest? It's in the financial system. I'm not shocked, right? It, in fact, makes sense, given the structure of the system. Right? Right, this money goes first right to the finance, to the realm of finance. Also, we know one of the biggest borrowers of money that would therefore receive it um, fairly early on would be the government. Right? So where does money go first? Right? It goes into right, the hands right, of the government, the hands of Wall Street. Right? And then over time, of course, it does trickle through the rest of the economy as they do spend this money. Right? But who gets the greatest benefit? Right? Those that get it before it has lost its value. Those, that, those who get the greatest proportion of it as well, right, before it has lost its value as well. Right, so if we really want to understand why is it that Wall Street is so wealthy, right, why is it that it seems like the government manages to find funds to, to hire more people all the time? In the middle of recessions, they hire more people. Right? Well, who's first in line when we're creating more money? It shouldn't be a shock. Okay. All right, so I, I think I will have to close there, unfortunately. Oh, well. So thank you very much. <laughs>